Is that in focus? Uh, I'm not the person to ask. Oh. Yes, I can read it, so it wasn't really good. Well, I've just had my cataracts done, so it's... <laughs> it's in focus oh, where well, the cataracts are. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> You'll be able to see it for free. <laughs> It's almost Christmas. It's, we should be thinking about people that want to stay with us. Two more.
we'll, we'll start with our first hymn anyway, so let's uh, stand and sing our first hymn, Long Ago, Prophets New. service on Advent Sunday. Um, so the first thing we need to do is to light our Advent, first Advent candle. Um, all the children look very busy. patriarchs of old, you are our Father too. Your love is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of David. Help us in preparing to celebrate his birth, to make our hearts ready for your Holy Spirit, to make his home among us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world. Amen. The notices for the week coming up are all on the news sheet. Um, mind you, our Advent course continues on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, all the previous sessions are on the YouTube channel, so if you want to catch up, 
um, or if you're not able to make it on Tuesday night, uh, you can follow them there. Um, the uh, inside of the news sheet is uh, continuing the reflections from the diocese on the theme of giving and hoping. And then uh, we've also got next Sunday our uh, nativity service, um, that's at 6 o'clock. So if you'd like to come along for that, if you want to dress up uh, as a character, it'll be a kind of scratch nativity. Um, so please do come along to that if you wish. Uh, we've also got the memorial service on the 13th of December for all those uh, where we remember those uh, with, that have died. Uh, there is a list at the back, or a, sign, a sheet at the back, if you want to add any names uh, of people to remember at that service. Um, so that sheet is at the back. I think that's all the notices I've got. Has anyone got any others? So let's say together our opening prayer. Eternal God, the light of the minds that know you, the joy of the hearts that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you, grant us so to know you that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may truly serve you, whose service is perfect for you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these your laws in our hearts. We have wandered and strayed from God's ways like lost sheep. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commands. For the sins that have made us slow to learn from Christ, reluctant to follow him, and afraid to bear the cross, Lord have mercy. For the sin that has caused the poverty of our worship, the formality and selfishness of our prayers, our neglect of fellowship and the means of grace, and our hesitating witness for Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord. For the sin that has led us to misuse your gifts, evade our responsibilities, and fail to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, have mercy. Lord. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, tolerant of injustice, quick to condemn and selfish in sharing your love with others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As we follow the way of Christ, we affirm the presence of God among us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God calls us to share in worship. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us on our journey. God calls us to share in prayer. Jesus said, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us on our journey. God calls us to share the scriptures. Jesus met his disciples on the road and opened the scriptures to them. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us to my God. God calls us to share in communion. Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us on our journey. God calls us to share in service. Jesus said, As you do it for the least of these, you do it for me. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us on our journey. God calls us to share the good news. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus, you are the way. Guide us on our journey. So it's time for our next hymn, Joy Has Gone.
seated for our readings. The first reading is taken from St Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honour of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth and in the world below will fall on their knees. This is the word of the Lord. This is the second reading, taken from Luke 1, verses 67 to 79. Read Zechariah's prophecy. John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke God's message. Let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to help of his people and has set them free. He has provided for us a mighty saviour, a descendant of his servant David. He promised through his holy prophets long ago that he would save us from our enemies, from the power of all those who hate us. He said he would show, us, he would show mercy to our ancestors and remember his sacred covenant. With a solemn oath to our ancestor Abraham, he promised to rescue us from our enemies and allow us to serve him without fear so that we might be holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High God. You will go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him, to tell his people that they will be saved by having their sins forgiven. Our God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us and to shine from heaven on all those who live in the dark shadow of death to guide our steps into the path of peace. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let's stand. So let us declare our faith in words used by Christians since the earliest centuries. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Be seated. So this year in our discipleship services we've been looking through the homilies of the Church of England and we come to our, the final one that we're going to look at uh, and this is from the second book of homilies 
Uh, it's homily number 12, and it's on the subject of the birth of Jesus. As we approach uh, Christmas, a common complaint from Christians is that society celebrates Christmas but forgets about Jesus. It doesn't understand the reason for the season. And that uh, is often true. But sometimes we as Christians don't fully grasp why Christmas is worth celebrating in the first place. Why it is so important that Jesus came in the way that he did. In some ways because of the way that society celebrates Christmas Sometimes we, as Christians, don't celebrate Christmas in the same way. We'd rather concentrate on Jesus uh, and his adult ministry, particularly, obviously, his death and his resurrection, rather than thinking about Christmas. But we do need to understand why the birth of Jesus is so important. And to do that, to understand that, we need to go back to the beginning we need to go all the way back to Genesis. And in Genesis we read that God made all creatures most excellently and wonderfully in their kind, but that humanity surpasses them all. And humanity is the pinnacle of creation because we are made in the image and likeness of God. And in Genesis we see humanity in all its perfection and not only is humanity created perfect it is also placed in a place of perfection in paradise the perfect man in a perfect world lacking absolutely nothing but we know in our own lives that prosperity and wealth often make us forget ourselves and also make us forget God and that's what happened to Abraham uh, sorry to Adam uh, in Genesis even though he was the perfect man in a perfect world that uh, perfection uh, meant that he forgot himself and God and he heard uh, the lies of the serpent and ended up disobeying God instead of being in the image of God he was now in the image of the devil Instead of being a citizen of heaven, he was now a slave of hell. And therefore, the just judgment of God comes upon him, and he was condemned to an everlasting death. Paul, in the letter to the Romans, reminds us that Adam's sin brought all humanity uh, to condemnation. Adam's disobedience made us all sinners and therefore we all deserve everlasting death, just like Adam. But even though we don't deserve forgiveness, God, in his great goodness and his tender mercy, uh, because of that, he created a new covenant and a new promise that he would send a Messiah to mediate between God and humanity. That covenant and promise was first made to Adam himself when God spoke to the serpent and said that the seed of woman would crush the serpent's head. The covenant and promise was then renewed to Abraham and to Isaac to bless all nations through their family. And that covenant and promise was repeated many times by the prophets who also gave the time, the place, the manner and the circumstances of the Messiah's birth. The prophets also spoke of the afflictions of the Messiah's life and of his death and resurrection. So for example we've got Isaiah prophesying that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. We've got Micah saying that the, virgin, that the uh, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Ezekiel talks of the Messiah coming from David's line Daniel talks about all the nations would serve the Messiah. Zechariah uh, prophesied that the Messiah would be born in poverty and would come riding on a donkey. Jeremiah talked about the Messiah being betrayed by, with 30 silver pieces. And Micah 
says that God would send Elijah ahead of the Messiah and there are many more prophecies as well. That prophecy of Micah that God would send Elijah before the Messiah came uh, to fulfilment in John the Baptist and it was John the Baptist's father uh, that we heard in our gospel reading that prophesy that Zechariah made uh, John the Baptist's father about his son the role he would play uh, but also about the Messiah as well and in uh, that Zechariah's song which uh, we know in church uh, liturgy as being the Benedictus he talks about that salvation that God is going to bring uh, from a Messiah coming from the house of his servant David. It talks about the promise uh, that God makes to Abraham and that is renewed through the holy prophets. And it talks uh, about um, that the Messiah would bring the forgiveness of sins in the tender compassion of our God, uh, Zechariah says, our Redeemer and our Saviour would come. So the Messiah is prophesied and expected all the way through the Old Testament and in uh, to the beginning of the New with John the Baptist. And we then find that Jesus is that Messiah who was prophesied. And if we doubt that Jesus was the Messiah that was prophesied, we've got loads of witnesses for it. We've got Gabriel uh, and his words to Zechariah and to Mary about who Jesus would be. We've also got John the Baptist himself as he starts his ministry pointing towards Jesus and saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. At Jesus' baptism we've got the witness of the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, saying who Jesus is and what he would do. Thinking of the Christmas story, we've got the wise men uh, and what they say about Jesus. We've got Simeon and Anna in the temple and many other examples in the New Testament of people witnessing to Jesus being the Messiah. So the birth of that Messiah should be enough uh, to make us want to celebrate uh, this great person who's going to bring salvation from God. But Jesus is more than just the Messiah because Jesus is perfect man and perfect God. The New Testament witnesses to this dual nature of Jesus, fully human and fully divine. Right there at the beginning of John's Gospel, we're told that the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And in our first reading from Philippians, Paul uh, repeats uh, what was probably um, already uh, part of the church's worship. It might have been uh, an early hymn that they sang uh, about who Jesus was, that he was in the very nature of God, but he does not he does not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing and took on human uh, appearance. Jesus was God and became human. That's one of the great things that we celebrate at Christmas. Christmas is not just about the birth of a Messiah but it's about the incarnation of God, of God becoming human. And we see uh, throughout the New Testament examples of his humanity and his divinity. As we think about his humanity, we see how Jesus hungered and thirsted, how he ate and drank, how he slept and how he woke, how he wept and how he died. But we also see his divinity we see him forgiving sins, we see him performing miracles, we see him healing people with just a word, we see him ca casting out demons, we see how he knows people's thoughts, we see how he commands uh, the wind and the waves, we see how he rises from the dead and he ascends to the Father. 
when Jesus spoke of his divinity, when he said that the Father and I are one, and he spoke of his humanity when he said that the Father is greater than I am. So throughout the New Testament it's clear that Jesus is both human and divine, but throughout church history heresies have come that deny either of those uh, facts. We have docetism uh, which, talks, which says that Jesus wasn't really human but just appeared to be human. And we have Arianism uh, that says that Jesus is, wasn't divine uh, but he was only human. And these uh, two heresies are still around today in various forms but they have important implications. Docetism, the idea that Jesus wasn't really human, uh, leads into an idea that the body isn't important, that what we do with our bodies is not important. And it also leads to an interpretation of scripture that relies on our feelings rather than what scripture actually says. It gives rise to that lie that the Holy Spirit is revealing something new, even if that contradicts what the Holy Spirit revealed in the written word. But then the heresy of thinking that Jesus wasn't divine uh, is seen in an attitude uh, where we look at Jesus and his teachings as being culturally conditioned, where Jesus is culturally trapped and can't speak outside of his own particular uh, culture and uh, the biases uh, and uh, uh, discriminations of his culture. Both of these heresies uh, are still around in various forms today even within the church. So we need to hold on to the great truth that Jesus is both human and divine, that, uh, that therefore our bodies are important, uh, what we do with them is important, that the interpretation of scripture is about listening to Jesus' words because they are the words of God, that they are our divine instructions for us to follow, uh, no matter what society or even our own feelings might say. But it's also important to hold together Jesus' humanity and his divinity because our salvation requires Jesus to be both human and divine. As we saw in Genesis, the transgression which brought sin and death into the world was by a human and therefore the satisfaction for that must also be made by a human. And as death is a punishment for sin, if someone is going to take on that punishment, they must be able to die. And of course, uh, you need to be a human uh, and a creature in order to be able to die. So Jesus has to be human uh, to satisfy that punishment for our sins. But also because Jesus was human, because he was raised uh, in the flesh, a physical resurrection uh, that is that shows us that all of us who are human with our physical bodies will also be raised uh, as we believe in him and as Jesus in his physical human body ascends to heaven and is seated at the right hand of his father to make intercession for us we know that we have a mediator who knows what it's like to be human who is able to empathize with us in all of our struggles so Jesus has to be human in order to take on the punishment for the sins of humanity but he also has to be divine in, in order that he can destroy death and give life in order that he can overcome hell and purchase heaven for us so Jesus by being our perfectly human and perfectly divine Redeemer, Saviour and Messiah. He changes all those who receive him from being wretched and corrupt children of perdition to being good and fruitful children of God. He does this through his humanity and his divinity. He does it by his taking on of human flesh and dying to take that, that punishment 
that we deserve. He came to save and to, de to deliver us, to fulfill the law for us, to call us to repentance, to reconcile us by his death as a prop propitiation for the sins of the whole world. But this is all the more wonderful as we don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve God's mercy and forgiveness. We don't deserve for God to take on humanity, to come to live and dwell among us and to die uh, that worst of deaths. Jesus did it because he loves us and he wants to show, extend his mercy to us, even when it was of no benefit to himself at all, even though he had to suffer uh, a, a death for it, and even though he doesn't get any gain from our salvation, God, in his tender mercy, comes to save us from the sins that we have brought on ourselves. So why then should we celebrate Christmas? We should celebrate Christmas because Jesus became a pilgrim on earth to make us citizens in heaven. Jesus became the Son of Man to make us sons of God. Jesus became subject to death so that we could live forever. But let's not just celebrate his birth. Let us also love him, obey him and serve him. Let us confess him with our mouths, praise him with our tongues, believe on him in our hearts and glorify him with our good works. Christ is the light, so let us receive that light. Christ is the truth, so let us believe the truth. Christ is the way, so let us follow the way, not just at Christmas time, but forever. So let's stand for our next song, Meekness and Majesty.
drop prize. Let us pray. As we prepare ourselves for the time when Christ comes again in glory, we pray for the grace and honesty to see what needs transforming our lives as individuals and as members of the Church of God. So let us walk in the light of the Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, you graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, our true source of power, grant us to all the peoples of your church, our bishops, clergy and lay people, your health-giving spirit of grace. Each, give each one of us a passion for your word and boldness in telling all we meet about your grace and love you give to us all. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, maker of all things and giver of life, have mercy on all that, nay, all the nations of this world. Send down your plentiful peace to all people. Let there be calm where there is violence, peace where there is war, freedom where there is bondage, love and unity where there is strife, abundance of food where there is starvation, good health where there is sickness, and life where there is death. For these and other good things we ask of you. Lord, hear us, or graciously hear us. May all the families on earth be blessed with mutual love and care and consideration for one another. May arguments and misunderstandings be properly resolved and difficult relationships refreshed and healed. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the sick. We pray for those who are sick in mind, body and spirit. In the quietness of our own hearts, we pray for those who ask our prayers, but are only known to us. Heavenly Father, light of the world, bless all who are in darkness. Shine upon them with love. Be with the despairing. Support the depressed. Comfort the sick. Give them your healing touch. Give them your hope. Give them your joy and give them your peace. Father, lighten their darkness today and evermore. And we give a special thanksgiving to God. We praise God and thanks that Peter Gallagher has been miraculously healed from pancreatic cancer. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious hear us. Merciful Father, sorry, we pray for those recently bereaved, the family and friends of Julian Kidd and Anne Waddington. We commend to you your, your love and mercy for those who have made the journey through death. Father, comfort those who miss them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us and a prayer for ourselves. Come, may, come may, my light, my Lord, my way. Come, my lantern, night and day. Come, my healer, make me whole. Come, my saviour, protect my soul. Come, my king, enter my heart. Come, holy presence, and never depart. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
pattern for our praying, as well as a prayer that we can make our own, at our Lord's command and following his example. So we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So together, our closing prayer. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Spirit of truth lead you into all truth. Give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. So go forth, walking the way of Christ in the power of the Spirit and to the glory of the Father. Amen. So let's stand for our final song, The Promise of the Ages.